In 2004, at the age of 30, Hidetaka Miyazaki dreamed of entering the video game industry and creating his own game. However, he faced significant obstacles. Not only did he lack any previous work experience in the field, but he was also considered too old in Japan to make a career shift. A formidable hurdle loomed before him. Would there be a gaming company willing to offer him employment? In less than 10 years, Miyazaki defied the odds and swiftly climbed the ranks from game planner to game director, eventually becoming a company president. Along the way, he consistently produced commercially and critically acclaimed games, one after another. Discover the remarkable journey Miyazaki undertook, transforming himself from an outsider to one of the game industry's most prominent figures. His path culminated in his inclusion on Time Magazine's list of 100 Most Influential People, and Dark Souls being hailed as the ultimate game of all time, surpassing the industry's biggest and most established franchises such as Zelda, Mario, Minecraft, Tetris, and others. Hidetaka Miyazaki grew up in a home that prohibited playing video games. While this might have seemed like a handicap for the future game director, it actually helped him build a strong foundation in RPG design and mechanics through the substitutes he discovered. Instead of indulging in video games, Miyazaki immersed himself in the media format that was most readily available and conducive to nurturing his imagination and creativity, printed text. In Japan, video games are highly popular, and it's a common hobby for Japanese kids, especially with handheld game consoles like those made by Nintendo. However, Miyazaki didn't have the privilege of experiencing that, as video games were not allowed in his home. To provide a clearer context, Let's look at the timeline of video games during Miyazaki's childhood. Given this timeline, we can safely assume that Miyazaki missed out on playing all of these games during his childhood, only gaining the opportunity to play video games when he entered university. This unique upbringing could also be the main reason why we don't find many influences or references in the Souls games to the popular video games of Miyazaki's childhood. Instead, we see more connections to the mangas and adventure books he constantly references. During an interview, Miyazaki said, While growing up, I was not allowed to play video games at home, only when I reached the university. This is one of the reasons why I find it difficult to share what video games I played a lot as a kid. However, I was able to play board games, and one of my favorites is sorcery. I would open revisit and play that game. Though it is not a video game, it is definitely one of the games that had a significant impact on me. As a young child growing up in Japan, Miyazaki was naturally expected to be exposed to and become very familiar with Japan's version of comic books, known as manga. To gain a clearer understanding of the manga that might have influenced him during his childhood, let's take a look at the timeline of manga during that period. It can be safely assumed that Miyazaki was exposed to most of the popular mangas in the list, which inevitably influenced his future work in the game industry, especially the manga Berserk. Additionally, in the list provided, we can observe two Studio Ghibli materials that the Souls games often reference, namely Nausicaa and Shuna's Journey, which is considered to be the prototype of Princess Mononoke. However, among all the entries in the list, the one that profoundly impacted Miyazaki was the manga Berserk. The series began serialization in 1989 when Hidetaka Miyazaki was 15 years old, an age in Japan where male readers typically transition from reading shonen, which focuses on heroic, fighting, and adventurous themes, to seinen, which delves into darker, grimmer, and more mature content. Berserk, being a dark fantasy, seinen manga, captivated the imagination of the young Miyazaki. In his later interviews, he consistently references Berserk when asked about the books he keeps on his shelves. The manga left a lasting impression on him, shaping his artistic vision and creative direction in his future endeavors. However, Miyazaki not only became familiar with mangas, but also discovered Western adventure-style books. These resources provided him with exposure to RPGs, an experience he would have missed due to restrictions on playing video games. In an interview, he shed more light on his childhood and said, Growing up as a kid, reading was what I truly loved. I enjoyed delving into books that were beyond my understanding. I always explored and aimed higher by reading advanced books. Typically, though I could read them, sometimes due to my young age, I couldn't delve too deep into them. Occasionally, I would only grasp half of the story. However, my imagination would fill in the other half, and that imaginary part would come to life. I find this experience truly enjoyable. 
I bridge the gaps of what I didn't fully understand in my reading, and my imagination takes me on a journey, eventually convincing me that I comprehend what I'm reading. Furthermore, he affirmed multiple times in interviews that reading books and playing text-based RPG board games significantly contributed to his unique sense of creativity and imagination. As a result, he aimed to replicate this experience, hoping his future players would undergo the same discovery and adventure he had while playing these text-based games. To better understand how adventure books might have influenced him, let's consider their timeline in relation to Miyazaki's childhood. It is interesting to note that two of the greatest adventure book series, Fighting Fantasy and Sorcery, both began when Miyazaki was at a young age, just beginning to read and attending elementary education. To demonstrate how Miyazaki's childhood fondness for adventure books still influences him today, let's take a look at screenshots from both Fighting Fantasy and Sorcery, as well as images from his latest game, Elden Ring. The homage he is paying here is beyond doubt and crystal clear. Only those familiar with the references will recognize them. But this doesn't diminish the experience for those who may not be aware of it. This aligns perfectly with Miyazaki's principle of hidden beauty. During an interview, Miyazaki emphasized his fondness for the storytelling style unique to adventure books, distinguishing them from traditional novels. He expressed his desire to convey this distinct experience through his games. Miyazaki said, I'm a big fan of stories that require some imagination to fully understand. When I was a kid, I truly enjoyed reading books that were a little advanced for me. I could only understand half the kanji and had to use my imagination to fill in the gaps. My goal is to bring that kind of experience to video games, where you use your imagination to complete the missing parts. Consequently, all of the games directed by Miyazaki adhere to the principle of environmental storytelling. Rooted in his childhood experiences, he holds this style of storytelling dear to his heart. As a result, the restrictions he faced with video games during his early youth played a crucial role in shaping him as a game creator, offering something truly unique and distinctive to his approach. Miyazaki added, I want to leave the discovery and interpretation of the world's lore and stories to the players. That's why I focus on environmental and subtle storytelling. Instead of the game automatically telling the story, players will find more value in discovering hints of the plot from items and people they encounter in the world. Of course, we might receive criticism if players don't get enough explanations, but I'm willing to accept that. The fun of imagining things for yourself is one of the core tenets I follow. I aim to share the joy of exploring a really dark and mysterious place and then attempting to shed light upon it. Like many individuals who discover something precious in their childhood, Miyazaki has maintained his love for reading throughout his life. In numerous interviews, he consistently emphasizes the significance of printed text as a powerful catalyst for creativity and imagination. Miyazaki said, Many of the ideas and themes expressed in our games find their origins in the written word, the things that come to life in our imaginations as we read, and the interpretations that unfold within our minds. While my pool of inspiration draws from various sources, if I had to single out one in particular, it would undoubtedly be books, especially those with text-based narratives. As I've mentioned before, one of my greatest pastimes is to immerse myself in these books, allowing my imagination to roam free and indulge in fantastical realms. This process serves as a significant wellspring of inspiration for my game development endeavors. To this day, Miyazaki prefers drawing inspiration from books more than any other sources. If you are curious about the contents of the shelves in his office, Miyazaki once shared a glimpse into his collection, saying, First, you would see the manga shelf, which contains Devilman and Berserk at the top. The adjacent bookshelf is filled with tabletop role-playing game rulebooks, with RuneQuest in front, together with the board game Dragon Pass. Another shelf is dedicated to novels, featuring classics of fantasy and science fiction, prominently highlighting George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire and Fever Dream. On an adjacent shelf, you would find a small library of game books, with sorcery and the guides for Titan and Out of the Pit being the foremost among them. Finally, you would discover art and reference books, including works by Umberto Eco and McNeil, as well as Colin Wilson's The Occult. This period in Miyazaki's life is the best time to answer the question of why he keeps referencing the Berserk manga, along with other influences such as Studio Ghibli films and the adventure books he loved as a child. The answer is simple. 
he pays homage to the very things that have contributed to his development and creative genius. It is not due to any shortages of inspiration or a desire to copy something that most people may not even recognize or acknowledge. This principle of hidden beauty is a core tenet of his approach. Acknowledging it doesn't require anyone's permission. You can choose not to recognize it, and yet your joy and experience in playing the Souls games will remain undiminished. However, for those who can discern this hidden beauty, it rewards them with a profound sense of joy and appreciation. The restriction on playing video games will not last long though. Miyazaki will soon be able to fulfill his yearning and play video games upon entering the university. In 1993, at the age of 19, Hidetaka Miyazaki enrolled at Keio University, where he pursued a degree in social science. Later on, he successfully completed his graduate studies here. To provide some context, Keio University is the oldest institution of Western higher education in Japan, and it holds a prestigious position as a top-tier university in the country. Its impressive list of alumni and faculty includes three former prime ministers, two astronauts, and six international honorary members of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Moreover, Keio University boasts the highest number of CEOs from companies listed in the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Considering this, we can truly recognize Miyazaki's entrance into Keio University as a significant achievement in itself. Furthermore, it is important to note that in Japan, the period of high school before entering a university is typically more stressful and strenuous compared to the years of actual university study. This heightened pressure is due to the hyper-competition among Japanese students to secure spots in their chosen universities. As a result, for those fortunate enough to gain admission to their preferred university, college life offers a chance to relax and build their social network, having already surpassed the rigorous selection process and demonstrated their merit as future representatives of the institution upon graduation and during their job searches. In an interview, Miyazaki provided insights into his college days. He said, Back in university and later in graduate school, I studied social sciences. During that time, the internet had just started, making it a fascinating period that made me think about a lot of things. Of course, video games were my main focus, and I was always playing them. Though I wasn't a very serious student and not in any way an expert, I believe my studies influenced me. During this time, it wasn't immediately evident how Miyazaki's degree in social sciences would benefit him in a potential career in the game industry. Nevertheless, Miyazaki repeatedly affirmed that his degree played a significant role in shaping the social interaction and network features found in the Souls games. Miyazaki said, I believe my degree in social sciences had a profound impact on my work, particularly in the areas of networking and communication. It also influenced my worldview, giving me a unique perspective distinct from other creators. For instance, Bloodborne itself reflects much of what I learned during my time as a student. You might find this somewhat pretentious, but when I contemplate network systems in video games, I approach it from a social sciences standpoint. This approach is interwoven with my creative process. During my university years, I delved into the studies of sociology and psychology. Even now, I continually revisit the themes I explored back then, and the experiences you are currently enjoying are the fruits of those endeavors. As we plan to release dedicated videos on the creation of each Souls game, we'll only provide a glimpse here of what Miyazaki refers to in terms of incorporating unique social interactions and network features influenced by his degree. Several examples include minimizing communication load between players, employing bloodstains as a gameplay element, introducing online invasions and cooperative play, and implementing a feature where a player can assume the role of a boss in a game level, as demonstrated in Demon's Souls and later in Dark Souls 3. To gain a better understanding of the popular games during Miyazaki's university days, let's delve into the timeline of video games from that period. Among all the games in this list, one stands out as the most influential, particularly in the growth of 3D games, The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. This game had a profound impact on many individuals who later entered the gaming industry. Prominent game creators, including Fumito Ueda of Ico, Amy Hennig of Uncharted, Sam Hauser of Grand Theft Auto, and many others, acknowledged its significant influence on their own works. Miyazaki himself expressed that The Legend of Zelda became a sort of textbook for 3D action games. 
The gameplay system of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time popularized features such as a target lock system and context-sensitive buttons, which have since become common elements in 3D adventure games. As you will soon discover in our video on the making of Demon's Souls, considered the first Souls game, the first major change Miyazaki introduced when he became the director was to alter the game's perspective and implement a lock system, similar to what we see in Zelda Ocarina of Time. It's also worth noting that all of the key games from From Software, including all entries in the King's Field series and the first Armored Core, were released during Miyazaki's university days. In interviews, Miyazaki reiterates that King's Field is one of his favorite games. In this stage of Miyazaki's life, an important question arises, what did his university days truly contribute to his development and creative genius as a game creator? Much like how his childhood laid the foundation for Miyazaki's passion for role-playing games and his deep knowledge of RPG mechanics, his time at university provided significant contributions to the kind of games in which he would excel in the future. Two pivotal events in gaming history played a crucial role in his growth. The release of Zelda Ocarina of Time during his final year of graduate studies and from software's King's Field during his first year at the university. The Souls games are heavily inclined towards meticulous combat and dark fantasy themes, two significant characteristics that both Ocarina of Time and the King's Field series helped instill within Miyazaki. These experiences further reinforced what he had already absorbed from the manga and adventure games he loved during his childhood. Moreover, Miyazaki's degree played a part in answering how he would execute and excel in his future endeavors. Overall, his university days were instrumental in shaping Miyazaki's creative direction as a game creator, combining his early influences with the impactful gaming experiences during his studies to create a unique and successful approach to game development. Since his university days, Miyazaki had a strong desire to enter the gaming industry. However, he couldn't seize the opportunity and ended up working for an IT company called Oracle. To gain a complete understanding and perspective of Miyazaki's journey, it's essential to delve into a specific aspect of Japanese culture known as shukatsu. Only by comprehending this cultural phenomenon can we truly grasp and appreciate the decision and sacrifice that Miyazaki later made. He resigned from his stable, reliable, and lucrative job at Oracle, opting to take a pay cut and start again as a junior employee in an obscure gaming company called From Software. Every year, starting from early April, thousands of soon-to-be graduates in Japan embark on a tradition where they dress in black business attire, clutching a briefcase that holds only their CVs. Their aim is to secure job positions at the most esteemed companies in the country. This ritual is a crucial part of a year-long hiring process that takes place during their penultimate year of university, commonly known as the season of Shukatsu. Shukatsu, short for Shushoku Katsudo, translates to job hunting activity in Japanese. It refers to the standard process that Japanese students go through to secure their first job after graduating from university. Typically, students secure a job in their final year of university and begin working in April of the following year. This well-organized system facilitates a seamless transition from university life to employment, with no gaps in between. Remarkably, using this system, more than 80% of job seekers receive a job offer approximately eight months prior to their graduation. Japanese students start preparing for their job search during the summer vacation of their third year at university, which is about 1.5 years before their graduation. For those fortunate enough to receive a job offer during shukatsu, their last year at university can be spent without worry, as they only need to focus on graduating and smoothly transitioning to the job that awaits them upon leaving the school. As mentioned earlier, the period before entering university is also highly stressful and demanding for Japanese students. Shukatsu, in a way, represents a continuation of that rigid and hyper-competitive process in the lives of Japanese students. However, once they successfully navigate through it and prove their abilities, they can look forward to a more stable and relaxed life. Shukatsu holds tremendous importance for Japanese individuals as the outcome of their job hunt can significantly elevate their social status. As Yuki Honda, a professor at the University of Tokyo's Graduate School of Education, wisely stated, whether they get a job when they graduate decides their whole life. In Japan, there is a well-known saying that goes, you're married twice, once to your company and once to your wife or husband. Between those two choices, 
the company will always take precedence. Keep this in mind as we approach the part in the video where Miyazaki intentionally resigns from his job to follow his dream of creating his own games. Now let's delve deeper into this aspect of Japanese culture to gain a more comprehensive understanding of Miyazaki's circumstances. The primary reason for the unified hiring cycle known as Shukatsu is that many companies prefer to train their new recruits on the job. Organizing the training process involving mentors and internal seminars would become significantly more difficult if inexperienced employees kept joining throughout the year. However, there is an essential consequence of this system that we must all be aware of and consider to appreciate Miyazaki's choices fully. The Shukatsu system offered lifetime employment to new graduates, which, in turn, provided job security and status for major Japanese firms. The prevailing mindset was that the only way one could lose their job was if the company went bankrupt. Historically, Japanese job seekers sought long-term employment with one company, aiming for job stability and career advancement within the same organization. With this knowledge and understanding of the Japanese context, we can now revisit Miyazaki and his post-graduation choices. In an interview, Miyazaki revealed, I originally wanted to work in the game industry. However, after finishing graduate school, there was a situation where I needed a lot of money. Subsequent interviews unveiled the specific reason for needing that money. He had to support his younger sister's college education. Instead of pursuing his passion, Miyazaki joined Oracle, an IT company renowned for its significant market share in database software. He started his journey at Oracle as a support analyst and eventually progressed to become an account manager. Rather than delving into the specifics of his work at Oracle during the four years, it would be more insightful to focus on the timeline of the games that were released during this period, particularly considering that Miyazaki's primary motivation for being at Oracle was to assist his sister. Two crucial years stand out in this timeline, significantly impacting Miyazaki's life and the fate of From Software, particularly regarding the future Souls games, the years 2001 and 2004. The significance of these years lies in the release of two influential games, Eco in 2001 and Elder Scrolls Oblivion in 2004. While we will provide comprehensive reasons for the importance of both games, let's focus on the game Eco for now, as it had a profound impact on Miyazaki's journey. Eco, released in 2001, played a transformative role in Hidetaka Miyazaki's life. The game had a profound effect on him, and its influence on his creative direction and career path cannot be underestimated. In our upcoming video about the making of Demon Souls, we will delve deeper into the significance of the year 2004 and how the game Elder Scrolls Oblivion eventually led to the creation of the dark fantasy game Demon's Souls. However, for the present moment, let's concentrate on exploring the pivotal game from 2001, Eco. Eco is a captivating video game developed by Team Eco and released in 2001 for the PlayStation 2. Its release garnered considerable attention and acclaim due to several remarkable aspects that were groundbreaking and influential in the gaming industry. One of the game's most striking features is its breathtaking art direction. It presents a minimalist and atmospheric world, featuring hand-painted textures and a subdued color palette. The visuals in Eco evoke a sense of wonder and melancholy, immersing players in a distinct and unforgettable atmosphere. The narrative of Eco is a testament to its uniqueness as it unfolds without any spoken dialogue. Instead, it relies solely on the character's body language and gestures to convey emotions and advance the story. This minimalist approach to storytelling adds depth and resonance to the relationship between the two main characters, Iko and Yorda. As players progress through the game, they become emotionally invested in their journey, making it a remarkable example of storytelling through gameplay. Iko has garnered praise for its ability to evoke a wide range of emotions, including a sense of isolation, companionship, and the determination to protect Yorda. This emotional journey sets the game apart from many other video game experiences and contributes to its lasting impact on players. Despite being released in 2001, Eco's impact and influence have endured over the years. It has garnered a cult following and serves as a significant source of inspiration for other games and developers. Genova Chen, the creator of art games such as Flower and Journey, has cited Eco as one of his most significant influences. The game Journey, for instance, clearly showcases Eco's influence in its visual presentation. The absence of a HUD, 
lack of an explicit tutorial, and the grand scale of architecture compared to the main character, evoking a sense of wonder and melancholy reminiscent of Eco. Another popular example is Neil Druckmann, the creative director of The Last of Us, who expressed his admiration for Eco, stating, But the main thing I loved about Eco was that relationship, that hand-holding mechanic that helps build a bond. It was the first time I realized you can create something meaningful through interaction, as opposed to just telling a story. Bruce Straley, the game director of The Last of Us, also shared how Eco significantly influenced him. <laughs> but that, that was one of those times where it's just like, he, it was the very first game that I played. It basically shaped my entire concept of how core mechanics are built and exploited and then switched up in a way with context to story and how those two things parallel each other, and then to come out with an emotional impact that made me cry. I cried. It was the first game that I ever played where it's just like, I'm in with the controller in my hand and I'm crying, and I'm just like, a game did this. And that shaped my entire concept of design. And you can see it in all of the games that I've been a part of since, of trying to get its core mechanics. It's building those core mechanics. It's switching up and taking away core mechanics based on story context. You know, it's getting a good arc so that you can play with the mechanics in parallel to this story arc and understanding that stuff. So that's interactivity, man. That's, that's what we can do. Numerous game designers, including Aiji Aonuma, Hideo Kojima, and Jordan Mechner, have acknowledged Ico's significant influence on their own games. Even renowned film director Guillermo del Toro has praised Ico as a masterpiece and a source of inspiration for his own directorial work. Undoubtedly, Ico stands out as one of the most influential games ever created. Now you might wonder how this all ties into the journey of Hidetaka Miyazaki. Miyazaki shared in an interview that the Dark Souls series would never exist without Ico. In fact, he would not have left Oracle and joined From Software if it wasn't for Ico. He said, On a personal note, after graduating from university and starting a new job, I was away from games for a while. However, I happened to play Ico at a friend's house on a recommendation. It was a beautiful, untold experience and a story that I had never imagined. I'm very sorry to my friend, but I was quietly moved and silent. That's when I decided to leave the company I was working for at the time and started working for From Software. I'm not exaggerating when I say it was the game that changed my life, and I'm proud that it was Eco and it was Mr. Weta's game. The game awakened me to the possibilities of the medium. I wanted to make one myself. Up until now, we have explored three significant stages in Miyazaki's life. His childhood, his time at the university, and his first job at Oracle. Each of these phases played a crucial role in shaping his growth and fostering his creative development. During his childhood, Miyazaki's love for manga and RPG books was kindled, and he was deeply influenced by their unique storytelling styles. Later, his education laid the groundwork for his expertise in 3D action games, while his experience at Oracle exposed him to the possibilities of the medium and ignited his ambition to create his own game. Now, he stands at the threshold of the next phase in his journey, but there remains one hurdle he must overcome, finding a new job in the gaming industry. As mentioned before, Miyazaki joined Oracle with the purpose of supporting his younger sister's university education. Considering that he joined Oracle in 1999 and spent approximately four years there, it can be assumed that he has successfully fulfilled his role in financing his sister's education, and she has completed her university degree. This achievement might grant him a sense of freedom to pursue a career that aligns with his passion. However, it's essential to consider the societal norms in Japan regarding work and employment. These cultural expectations may still exert some influence on his decisions and career choices. To gain insight into the culture of Japan, particularly in their workforce and job expectations, it's essential to understand the concept of lifetime employment. In Japan, there exists a traditional expectation that employees will remain with a single company for their entire working careers. This practice is rooted in the idea of reciprocal loyalty between the employer and the employee. In contrast, many Western countries have a culture of job hopping, where individuals change jobs more frequently to seek better opportunities or career growth. In addition to lifetime employment, Japanese companies often follow a seniority-based promotion system, where employees are promoted based on their years of service rather than solely on merit or performance. This means that remaining loyal to one company ensures not only financial stability, but also secures career growth. However, for someone like Miyazaki, 
following his true passion would require him to make significant sacrifices. He must be willing to give up the prospect of lifetime employment, accept a potential pay cut, and face the pressure of searching for a job in a field where he lacks professional experience. A comment from one of Miyazaki's colleagues at From Software sheds light on his later career shift. He is one of a kind. In Japan, it is customary for new employees to join a company as a graduate and remain there for life. This has been true in the past and continues to hold true even today. This remark underscores the rarity of Miyazaki's decision to break away from the traditional career trajectory and pursue his passion despite the cultural norms surrounding lifetime employment. His decision to pursue his passion despite the challenges reflects his determination and courage to chart his own course. Fortunately, Miyazaki found an opportunity with a small gaming company called From Software, which took a chance on him and offered him a position as a game planner. This marked the start of his new career in the gaming industry. In an interview, Miyazaki expressed his gratitude, saying, There were only a few companies that would consider hiring a 30-year-old with little experience in planning. I consider myself fortunate that From Software took a chance on me, especially since I was already a fan of their game King's Field. To gain a more complete context, let's explore a short history of From Software. Founded in Tokyo by Naotoshi Zin on November 1st, 1986, From Software initially focused on developing business applications. It wasn't until 1994, during Miyazaki's second year at the university, that the company made its debut in the gaming industry with the release of King's Field for the PlayStation. While the game achieved commercial success in Japan, it didn't see a release in other regions. However, its sequel, King's Field 2, found its way to North America and Europe in 1996. From Software continued to expand its portfolio with titles like the horror game Echo Knight and the role-playing game Shadow Tower in 1998, following the release of King's Field 3. One of their significant milestones came in 1997 with the launch of Armored Core, the first installment in their flagship series of mecha combat games. What's important to remember is that despite now being considered a major gaming company known for creating AAA titles like Elden Ring and Sekiro, From Software had humble beginnings and remained relatively obscure before their breakout success. This breakthrough was driven by the creation of the Souls games by Miyazaki. Without Miyazaki's contributions, it's likely that From Software would still be relatively unknown hidden in obscurity. However, Miyazaki considered himself lucky to have entered the gaming industry. This company appeared to be the perfect place for his potential to flourish to its fullest extent. Just imagine if Miyazaki had been hired by industry giants like Nintendo, Capcom, or Konami, companies that were considered the most significant game developers during that time. I firmly believe that From Software was precisely the kind of company that was willing to provide the chance trust, and freedom necessary for Miyazaki's growth, as they demonstrated later when they handed him full control over a failed project called Demon's Souls. But let's not get ahead of the story. Instead, let's step back to the time when he first joined the company. Upon getting hired, Miyazaki's initial assignment was to work as a planner for a title called Armored Core Last Raven, joining the development midway. Reflecting on this experience, he stated, in Last Raven, I had the opportunity to delve into various aspects of the game, starting with working on the enemy AI. Later, I was given tasks related to mission design, game progression, text, menus, parameters, and more. This gradual involvement laid the foundation for my understanding of the game production process. The advantage was that, being a sequel, this title already had a relatively stable game system and engine, allowing me to explore and gain experience in multiple areas. Subsequently, the game Armored Core Last Raven was released in Japan on August 4, 2005, several months after Miyazaki's arrival at From Software. After completing his first project, he was assigned as the main planner for a new game called Armored Core 4. However, midway through its development, he was promoted to the position of game director. In an interview, the host asked Miyazaki how he managed to become a game director in such a short period of time. The host said, you mentioned being treated like a new employee, but it's quite unusual to become a director after just one project. Can you tell us the reason behind this trust in you? Miyazaki replied, To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I think external factors played a significant role rather than my own actions. 
The opportunity to become a director arose during the prototype production, and the current situation wouldn't have been possible without the need for a new director. Subsequently, Miyazaki continued as the game director for the next title, Armored Core for Answer, thoroughly enjoying his work on the Armored Core series. However, deep down, his true passion lay in the fantasy RPG genre, a preference that had its roots in the adventure books he cherished during his childhood. So, he was very excited when he heard about a new game being developed by a separate team, and its title was Demon's Souls. Miyazaki learned that the project was struggling and beset with various issues. It was considered a failure, but it interested him. Could this be the opportunity he had been waiting for? Miyazaki said, I'd worked exclusively on Armored Core titles in my role at From Software, but I'd always wanted to make a dark fantasy game that drew on the fighting fantasy series of books. The Demon's Souls project was the opening I'd always been waiting for, 